Welcome back. We're in time for some curious economics today. Um, so yeah, today we'll be talking about elasticities. So how elastic like a rubber band may be. Um, that's not funny. Okay. So um, yeah, so thanks for following Isabel. Um, hope you get something out of the channel and yeah. So let's get started. So for part one of elasticities, we're going to cover PED, price elasticity of demand, and also um, YED actually. So I've kind of shifted the two. Um, so for lesson two, we'll look at cross elasticity and price elasticity of supply. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started with, so that stands for price elasticity of demand. And what that measures is how responsive quantity demanded is compared to a change in price. So let's say if you are selling um, corn in the can. So let's just draw some corn in a can. So let's see here. Okay. So maybe corn on a, on a cob would be nice. That is a corn on a cob. I guess it's like more round than, more round than square like. Okay, so let's say you're selling like corn on a cob. And normally you might sell it at like five pounds and you might sell like 10 of them. If you decrease the price, to say four pounds, then perhaps we might sell 20 of them. So the quantity you can see has increased by two times, but we've only decreased the price by 25%. So this is two times would be 100% actually. So in this case, you can see the um, consumers are actually very sensitive to the price change when you're selling corn on the cob. So in this case, we would say the product is very elastic. And similarly, it works the other way around as well. So if you increase the price slightly, you should have a very big decrease in the quantity. So basically, that's what price elasticity of demand measures. And if it is greater than one, it means that it is elastic because the percentage change in quantity is greater than the percentage change in price. So here we've got percentage change in quantity and then the percentage change in price. And if it is greater than one, that means for this fraction, the numerator, the percentage change in quantity demand would be higher than percentage change in price for it to be greater than one. And similarly, if it's the other way around, then it would be inelastic and then it would be less than one. So, oh, let me just change the music and I see a question from Isabel as well. So, okay, much more relaxing. Why is it that sometimes people buy more when the price increases? Good question. So. Normally, this would be a case of what we call an abnormal demand. So if you think of like um, status symbols or if you think of maybe luxury handbags, in most cases for normal products or for general products, it would look like this in terms of the demand curve. So we got the price and then we got the quantity. So when the price is very high, then we would buy less. And when the price is low, we would buy more. But say for like luxury handbags, we might have like a demand curve like that. So if it's more expensive, then it's seen to be more valuable and like more, um, it would be more seen as a status symbol to kind of show that you are actually um, a part of high society. So in that case, then when the price of some limited edition watches or handbags is more expensive, then people might actually buy more of it. And there would be like more quantity, perhaps. Or there would be more quantity demanded of say limited 
and luxurious supreme um, baseball caps or supreme tissues or toilet rolls given the coronavirus <laughs> so um, yeah but in general um, to simplify things we would assume that or most or all products at least in A-level economics to have a demand that is downward sloping so we would assume that if the price is higher then we would buy less and if the price is low we would buy more and that explains why that PED is always negative as well because normally if the price increases so if the percentage change is increasing um, then the quantity would decrease since if it's more expensive we would buy less but if it's the other way around similarly we would also get a negative number because if the price is decreasing then we would buy more quantity so either way the top or the bottom of the fraction would be negative and PED would nearly always be negative as long as we are facing a normal demand curve Okay, and so Lola is asking about houses. Um, if we take houses, for example, there is a small quantity of them, but the prices increase significantly every year. Ah, good question. So when we look, actually look at the market, we look at both demand and the supply. So let me show you here. So in this case, we are only looking at the elasticity of the demand. And when we talk about the quantity in the market, it's more like people want to buy more, but not necessarily more of them are transacted in the market. But anyway, if we go back to a normal demand and supply situation. So if we have, there are like several cases of which the market price would increase. So originally, the market would produce at a point where demand is equal to supply so we would have this price here p and then let's just say p1 and then we've got this quantity here q1 however if say people are demanding more housing or when there is a not there is a small quantity of houses being built that particular year then in that case or perhaps there's just like less developers then we would have like a lower supply and then you can see that there would be a higher price when there's a lower supply or there might be another reason for higher prices is that there might be say higher demand in the market so if I just draw another one where we have both demand and supply so if there's higher demand in the market, you can see that in this particular diagram that the original price has again increased from P1 to P2. So um, you can see in this case, the price of an actual product in the market is reliant on many other factors apart from, so including demand and supply. But when we look at the price elasticity of demand, we are just looking at the demand for the product and how many people are willing to buy at that particular price. So we're not actually looking at the market price, but we're just looking at the price that people are willing to buy at and how much they're willing to buy for that price. Uh, so normally, of course, yeah, it goes back to our normal assumption here that when things are expensive, um, people would tend to buy less. So in this case, if got p1 here is more expensive then people will tend to buy less and if it's cheaper then people will tend to buy more but since we haven't considered supply in this diagram we aren't actually looking at the market price so just bear that in mind okay so let's move on but do pop into the chat if you've got any questions um here we've got like an example of demand and price elasticity of demand so i'm not sure if they have these products in Sestry, yeah? but there are three types of plush dolls here so we've got uh, plush teddy bears oh, how do you draw a teddy bear um, 
This is not a not a very good teddy bear, but I'm trying my best. Okay, not too bad. And now a bunny as well. Now the bunny looks like the same as the teddy bear. Oh, thanks for following, John. John Star. And then we've got an emoji, so emoji is easy. Emoji with braces. Okay, so we've got these three products. And you can see um, the different prices and the different quantities. So as usual, in most cases, if, like you, the, if you decrease the price, then people are likely to buy more. Yeah. Or people are likely to want to buy more or demand more. So again, um, we don't want to confuse the demand with the entire market. So in this case, if we're asked to calculate the demand for like the elasticity of demand for plush teddies, then we can just use the formula. So what is the formula again? The formula is PED equals the percentage change in quantity demanded for teddies divided by the percentage change in the price for these teddy bears. And if you guys have been studying or paying attention in GCSE maps, you would know in order to calculate a percentage change for a product, there is a particular formula. So we want to get the new number or new value minus the old value divided by the old value and then times it by 100%. So in this case, if we just put in the numbers into here, then we can figure out how much the price has changed for teddy bears. So let's figure out how much the price has changed. So the new value is six. So we just do six and then our six dollars minus eight dollars, which is the old value. And then we divide it by eight dollars and we times it by 100%. Okay, so now use your mental maths. What do you think that would be? I'm not using mental maps. I need I need rough paper, even even though I'm Asian. Um, okay, so there. So it decreased by twenty five percent for the price. So you can see that in this case we've got a negative at here because six minus eight would be negative two. So then we would have a negative twenty five percent here. And this just signals that the price has been decreasing. If this number is positive, then that means the price has been increasing. So that's an important point to be aware of. Because otherwise, we might get the wrong sign. Like the PED might become negative or positive, uh, which is not good. So um, we know the change in price, or the percentage change in price is minus 25%. Then we just put in minus 25% here. And then let's do the percentage change for the quantity as well for the teddy bears. So again, we get the new value, which is this time we've got more people buying teddy bears or more people who are demanding teddy bears. So new value minus the old value divided by the old value times about 100. And now we're going to have 60 over 160 times 100. complicated 3 over 8 times 100 to 25 75 over 2 that's what 30 32.5 percent okay cool so in this case we know we see that there's a positive number because it's an increase in the quantity that people are buying so yeah and then in this case all we have to do is to divide one by the other. So it looks too complicated. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> you can see the answer in the next page. <laughs> so. Oh. So there we go. Percentage change in quantity demand divided by percentage change in price. There, it should be like minus 1.5. 
Okay, cool. And you see, like, the formula is pretty much the same here. So we calculate the percentage change first for the quantity here, and then we calculate the percentage change for the price first here. And then we divide the two numbers according to the formula. So recently, I think you guys have heard about the oil price crash. And one way to explain it, um, this gigantic dip, is because that the demand for oil has been quite inelastic. So normally, um, why we demand oil is because we drive around in cars and also we take flights to different places on vacations and now because of coronavirus we aren't really traveling right so we actually aren't using any petrol or we aren't actually using any fuel so we aren't actually using that much oil and no matter how the price of oil decreases we still aren't gonna buy more petrol since we just don't need it right so in this case the quantity demanded for oil so how much we buy is actually very insensitive to the price of oil. So even if they decrease the price of oil to a negative amount of money, people might still not buy it. So that's one way to explain the huge drop in the oil price recently. However, another way to explain the fall in the oil price is just that there's no demand for it, basically. So if we do the demand and supply diagram again, um, again, we've got price here and quantity in the market so and then we've got demand and supply if there's basically no demand for all then you can just draw it like this so there's a huge fall in the demand and then you can see there will be a big drop in the price from p to p1 and of course the market quantity would fall as well because nobody is actually buying as much oil compared to before so yeah so that's one way that we can apply elasticity in the real world. So if we put elasticity on a diagram, it would kind of look like this. So if the demand is elastic, the curve is going to be quite... Um, what's the opposite of steep? How would you describe the opposite of steep? It's very not steep. Unsteep. <laughs> unsteep so very, very horizontal and because if the price changes so we've got p1 and then we've got p2 if the price changes from p1 to p2 then we can see that the quantity change is very big or the percentage change in the quantity is very large so in this case demand would be elastic so if price increases by 5%, the quantity change is even greater. No, actually, this should be decrease, right? Yeah. And similarly, if this is very steep, or if it is very inelastic, even if there is a big fall in the oil price, there aren't going to be a lot more demand for oil, or there aren't going to be a lot more quantity demanded for oil. so people aren't going to buy a lot more just because the oil price has decreased okay so if we move on so of course we are all human and all of us need food so let me just draw a pineapple here um, not a really good one but <laughs> and you can see these are like some of the PEDs or price elasticities of the different types of products. Um, it's the data is quite old, but you can have an idea that actually for most food products, um, they would have an inelastic demand. And how do we know that it's an inelastic demand? So we look at the number here, all right, of these products. So you can see most of these products are below one, right? So if it's smaller than one, and we recall the formula, this means that the the change or the percentage change in quantity is lower than the percentage change in the price. 
So this means that these products are not very sensitive to price changes. So we would still buy a similar number or similar amount of these goods, even if the price changes. So say if the price of soft drinks change, or if the price of eggs change, we would still have eggs for breakfast, simply because we're so used to it. And yeah, whereas you can see um, juice is actually comparatively more elastic than like cheese or sweets and sugars. I guess every, I guess a lot of people are like addicted to sweets. So that's why they must crave their sugar, even though if the prices increase significantly. And of course we use sugars for cooking as well and oils for cooking. So, okay, cool. So that's just out of interest. And this is for the US. So for other countries, the price elasticity may be different. <clears throat> and of course, let's look at some alcohol as well. So please don't become alcoholics, but we can see that the price elasticity for these different types of goods are different. So in this case, um, the PED or the elasticity of beer tends to be less elastic or more inelastic. So when we look at like the elasticities, you know, we've mentioned that how the elasticity is always negative. So if we look at the number and to judge whether it's greater than one or smaller than one, it's best to ignore the negative sign when we're trying to interpret that. Because otherwise, um, it's, get, it's easy to get confused. So in this case, we can see beer is inelastic. So most likely you might have beer at the pub with your meal. Although you can do that for wine as well, but this is called unitary elastic. But um, you can see for spirits, actually it's quite elastic. So it's like 1.5. So I guess one of the reasons might be because we tend to see like whiskeys and other spirits as a good time out and as a more of a luxury goods as well. If it's a very old, what Scottish Scottish spirit? What are those called? Um, um, single malt Scotch whiskey. Yes. So for those spirits, it's more like um, more of a luxury product. And if there's a decrease in price, then we are more likely to buy more of it or an even greater quantity of it. But whereas for beer, even if it increases in price, we might still drink a similar amount because we're so used to drinking beer. And whereas for spirits, we might use them for gifts as well. And yeah, so, and one particular thing here is for wine, you can see the elasticity is at one. And what this means is that it is unitary elastic. So at one, the percentage change in the quantity demand would be the same as the percentage change in the price. So that's why it would be one, the PED. And of course this means if price goes up by 5%, we would buy 5% less wine. So that's what this is saying. So the number is actually the same. Okay. And then now we see that we've got some other types of products as well. So you can see most of these are more luxurious products. So more luxurious products tend to have a higher um, elasticity. So for airline travel, we aren't really doing much of that anymore. But, and we can see that um, for these automobiles, uh, I'm not sure why fresh tomatoes as well, but <laughs> for say automobiles, we are actually buying a lot less if the price is slightly increased. Or similarly, if, a, if the price slightly decreased, we might buy a lot more, simply because they are not necessities. Yeah? So we'll look into more about the different determinants of the um, elasticity in this slide. So we can see that For these are the four main factors 
that determines how elastic or inelastic a good is. So if the price of a good takes up a very large percentage of how much you earn, so like if you're buying a nice piece of steak that costs like 50 pounds or something, but your monthly income is 50, is a hundred pounds. So steak, income. Then in this case, the cost of the steak is taking up a uh, 50% of her income, of her high percentage of her income. So the more elastic it is, then most likely the good would take up a higher percentage of her income. Or maybe it's better to put it the other way around. So the more percentage it takes up your income, then the more uh, elastic that good usually is. And that is because, again, these tends to be like more luxurious products that we don't necessarily need. So that's why it's okay to kind of delay your purchases in terms of these expensive stakes. And then secondly, we've got the degree of necessity. So as we've discussed previously, the more you need a product, the less elastic it is and you would have a lower PED. And that's because if you need water or rice very desperately, you would still want to pay a large amount of money for it, even though they are extorting your uh, livelihoods because you need the product, right? So you're willing to pay any amount if you're very thirsty or if you are going hungry. So yeah degree of necessity would be another determinant for the price elasticity of demand. Number of substitutes would be another one because say if you know we just talked about rice so I'm not sure how to draw rice but Asians like rice <laughs> and noodles but so we might we might pay a lot of money for rice even though to obtain the rice because we need it so much and we are so used to eating it. But if there are more substitutes like bread or like noodles, so I'm just trying to draw some noodles, then as a result, we would need the rice less, right? Because instead of buying rice, we can just buy more noodle or we can buy more bread. So in that case, um, because we are less reliant on the rice, we can choose to buy less rice if the price of rice has increased significantly. So in that case, the we would be more elastic. So our demand for the quantity of these two goods might decrease much more when the price of the uh, when the price of rice increases significantly. And then finally, we've got the time period, right? So in general, um, the longer the time frame, then the more elastic the demand for that product would be. Because the longer uh, the time frame, the more possible for us to change our tastes, such as I might replace my rice with noodle. And I can kind of like break the habit the more time I have. So in that case, then again, this would make me more flexible in terms of the things that I demand and I can just buy less rice if my preference for food has changed, say, in like six months or so. So in that case, um, the PED would become more elastic because it's easier to switch and to replace um, the product. Yeah. So we can adapt our purchasing habits and find other substitutes. It's kind of like the case when you um, arrive in the UK, but you're actually from overseas, and then you might actually have less rice and more fish and chips. Then you kind of replace your products. Okay. So um, this is the unitary elasticity that we were talking about. So if price goes up by 5%, then demand 
uh, the quantity demanded goes down by 5%. And that would be unitary elastic. So that's why the line is like 45 degrees. So it's like between steep and not steep. And of course, um, in economic theory, we like to test extremes. So there is something called perfect elasticity and perfect inelasticity. So we can see in this diagram, um, for perfectly inelastic, no matter what the price is, we would still demand the same amount of the good. And whereas for perfectly elastic, if the price just increased slightly, then we won't demand any of the good. So the price must be at P1 for us to demand the good. And if the price decreased slightly at P3, we would demand an infinite amount. So that's what it means by perfectly elastic. So of course, um, these two things aren't applicable to the real world. But the most applicable for perfectly inelastic might be, say, if you're on the verge of dying of first and you're willing to pay any price in order to get some water. Or bottled water or tap water. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit about elasticity, but what's the point? Like, wh why are we learning about elasticity? Like, how can it benefit us in our lives? So, one of the ways is to use it in business. So, if you learn PED and you use it, then you would learn or you would figure out that it's better to decrease prices when demand is inelastic. And you would raise prices when demand is inelastic. Yeah? So you would decrease prices when demand is elastic, raise prices when demand is inelastic, and then you would earn more money. And you'll see why in the next slide. So normally for a company or for a market or industry, in order to calculate the total amount of revenue that they're earning, we just need to multiply the price with the quantity. So let me explain. If say you are selling apples, apples at five pounds each, oh, five pounds each, and then if we were selling ten apples. Then in this case, um, five pounds each and 10 apples, then the total amount of money that we get is going to be, what, 50 pounds, right? So actually, that would be exactly the area of this rectangle here. So it's like five pounds times 10 apples. So you can see that the area of the dotted line actually represents how much uh, the entire industry is earning in terms of the product that they're selling. And in this case, so it can also be applied to the firm. So we can say this is a demand for a particular product within a company as well. So in that case, that would be like their revenue. And as we know, if it is if the demand is elastic, it is quite shallow. I remember the word now. It's not unsteep, it is shallow. So uh, it, the demand curve in this case is quite shallow. And if we decrease the price of, of apples, a lot more people are going to buy apples. So in this case, we'll be earning a lot more in terms of the rectangular area because we'll be um, taking four pound an apple and then we times it by 20 apples. So in this case, we'll be earning 80 pounds. So we can see that we're earning a lot more compared um, to previously, the 50 pounds. So we're earning like what, 30 pounds extra, something like that, just by decreasing the price of apples. So it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Actually, if you decrease the price, more people would buy it. And as a result, in total, you would earn more. 
However, don't actually take the apple as an example, because most likely apple and fruits are inelastic, right? So it would be like this diagram. So, um, but that's just as a case study. Um, and similarly, if demand is inelastic, like for water or energy, so that we use to heat our homes during winter, then there will be a lot of incentive for companies to increase their prices because no matter what the price is, it would still need it. So even if the quantity decreases or even if we turn less heating on, we only turn a bit less on. But whereas the price might have increased by like, say 30% or something like that. So again, we can just do a quick calculation. Oh, thanks for following Holistic Storm. That's a very uh, intimidating name. <laughs> but, um, uh, and then we've got, say, if we used to use 100 kilowatts of energy, and now we only use 90 kilowatts to heat our homes because we know the electricity bills are going up. But the prices has gone up significantly from say five pounds to 10 pounds. Then in that case, the total amount that these energy companies are making is what? Five pounds times 100 kilowatt in the original instance, which is 500 pounds. But now they've increased it to 10 pounds, but now we're only using 90 kilowatts. So now it's like 900 pounds. So you see that the company can actually nearly like double how much energy that they're selling us simply by messing with the price and understanding the use of elasticity. So yeah, if people need the product, you want to price them as high as possible. The basic, that's basically the point of elasticity. Uh, yeah, so that's what we've been talking about here. Okay, so there are some other applications of elasticities as well. So, for example, taxes. So the government always wants to tax goods that are relatively inelastic, like cigarettes. So, this is a pack of cigarettes. Okay, I think it kind of looks more like french fries now. But okay, <laughs> so let's say if the government taxes cigarettes, then because cigarettes are quite addictive, right? That's why a lot of people might buy cigarettes even if the tax on the cigarettes are like 30 or 40 percent. So the tax is actually very high on cigarettes, but since they're addicted to the product and they need to smoke it, they would still buy the good. So because of that, the amount of tax revenues that the government can raise from cigarettes is actually very, very high. Say if we compare the tax revenues that we can get from cigarettes to tax revenues that we can get from like handbags or whatever, if they do decide to tax it, most likely the tax revenue from cigarettes will be much higher because um, cigarettes are demand inelastic and people would buy it even or no matter what the price of it is. Of course, people would like complain to the government and like they would try to change the taxes, but um, that's another story. So in general, the government, in order to make more money from taxes, they would want to tax on goods that are inelastic, so on products that we need and rely on. Uh, patrol duty is another one. So if you buy petrol for a car, then actually the government is taking from taxes from that. Then same for alcohol as well. And so one other way to use elasticities is to look at manufactured products versus uh, commodities. So in general, manufactured products like um, uh, cans of pet food and also like teddy bears, like we looked at. These are actually more elastic, yeah? Because they aren't, ne aren't necessities. 
So these toys and socks we can buy anytime or we can kind of delay the purchase of these products. But whereas for primary commodities like rice or food or wheat, um, these are necessities, right? So their elasticity tends to be lower and they would be less elastic. So that means we would tend to um, buy them even if the price of them increases significantly. And because there aren't any substitutes for these time, types of food. So during the coronavirus, um, the price for food has increased quite a bit. Yeah. And that's because everyone was worried that there might be like a shortage and things like that. So because these are necessities, even if the price of these food has increased during the coronavirus sh shopping crisis, people would still buy it. And that's kind of driving the increase in the price for these products. So that's pretty much it for price elasticity of demand or PED. And now let's have a quick look at income elasticity of demand or YED. So let's say if all of a sudden you won the lottery or your parents won the lottery, but they only gave you a hundred pounds from the lottery winnings. Of course, understandably, you would be very unhappy and very mad. Um, and then they would say, let's go crazy at the shopping mall. Then do you think you would buy more products or buy less products? So normally we would assume that you should buy more of the good that you have already in mind. And instead of buying less, because now that you're richer, you're, you're able to afford more, right? And that is what income and less of demand is trying to measure. Yeah. So, but don't worry about winning the lottery, it's quite unlikely because you're more likely to be crushed by a meteor than to win a lottery, supposedly. So what is income elasticity of demand? It just looks at the relationship between how much we earn and how much we demand for a particular product. Yeah. So it measures how responsiveness or how much more we buy of a certain good if we get a pay rise. So in this case, for hardworking staff, the big boss would pay you and say that you're lucky to have a job. And here we've got the formula for income elasticity of demand. Yeah. So, oh, I've given you the answer here already. Have I? Okay, that's fine. So let me just put this formula in a vertical term. So Income elasticity of demand is equals to the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in income. So Y stands for income in economics. Yeah. Okay, so um, in this particular example, if you want to guy, uh, if you want to, well, if you wanted to get two pairs of shoes, but now you're getting three pairs after your pocket money doubled, then what happens is that we want to calculate the changes in how much we want, which is in this case, three minus two over two times 100%. Again, the percentage change formula is here. So then you're going to have plus 50%. Whereas for the change in income, is 100% right because we've doubled the income so again the new income minus the old one divided by the old income times 100% so it would be 100% yeah. so income increases by 100% and the quantity demanded for that good increases by 50% so because we buy three pairs of shoes instead of two so in this case the actual figure for YED is just what? Uh, 50 over 
and then that would be equals to a half or 0 0.5 and yeah so that's how you calculate yd so again the the percentage changes and the signs are important so if it is increasing because both numbers are increasing in this instance from 2 to 3 and 100 to 200 we want the top and the bottom to be positive so it will be positive 50 percent and positive 100 percent and in this case we would know that for this particular type of good it is actually reacting positively to an increase in income. So we are actually buying more of it when income increases, and we call these normal goods. So most goods are called normal goods because we would tend to buy more uh, when our income increases, as you'll see on the next slide. Oh, no, it's another example on the next slide. But, um, goods here there we go so for normal goods demand increases or quantity demand increases when income increases but for inferior goods demand decreases when income increases So for normal goods, you can think of like food or like uh, toys and things like that. Um, whereas for inferior good, supposedly, because when you are making more money, you would actually buy substitutes of these goods instead. So what I mean by that is instead of smoking like cigarettes, you might go and smoke like big fat cigars if you're rich or if you get a bigger paycheck. Yeah. Um, and similarly, you're not going to have McDonald's if you're rich. You're going to go to a three-star Michelin restaurant instead. So you can see why the demand for some products would actually decrease um, when you actually get richer. And we call those products inferior goods. So for inferior goods, they would tend to have a negative YED because as we've discussed, there is going to be a negative income change. So a decrease in income. Oh, let's put it the other way around. So instead of doing a decrease in income, let's just say we would buy less of the product, right? So there will be a decrease in the quantity demanded, even though if there's an increase in income. So we can see that the YD would be negative because there's a negative number divided by a positive number. And then for normal goods, we would see that both would be positive because when the income increases, or when you earn more, you would buy more as well. So then this would be a positive number. So for normal goods, you would have a positive YED. And then for inferior goods, you would have a negative YED. Okay. Uh, we've looked at that just now. Okay, so um, it's also important to look at the elasticity in terms of like the actual number as well. So we've described about the positive and negative YED, which shows us the type of good. So there's normal good. But another way to look at YD is whether it is bigger than one or smaller than one. So normally, if YD is inelastic, so if YD is smaller than one, what this means is that the percentage change 
in quantity is greater than the percentage change in income, right? If it is bigger than one. I should have put that on the bottom then. So if our income increases by like 5% and we buy like 10 more handbags or something, then it would be YD elastic. Yeah. So that's usually the case for like luxury products. Whereas for necessities, it would be the other way around. So for necessities, the percentage change in how much we buy might be smaller than the percentage change or the percentage increase in our incomes. That's because even though if our incomes are much higher, even if we've got a promotion, then we might not buy a lot more olive oil, right? Or we might not buy a lot more salt because these are necessities and we just need a certain amount of them. So in that case, they would be income inelastic. So they don't respond as much to the change in your income. So there is another um, way to interpret this as well in terms of interpreting YED using the number, but not in terms of whether it's positive or negative. So here we've got three lovely products. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to um, figure out or guess whether this product is YD positive or negative and whether the income elasticity of demand for it is high or low. Yeah. Okay, I think that's about that's about ten seconds. So first I would say most of these goods would be normal goods. Yeah. So if it is a manufactured good like this pushin, pushin, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, pushin here, then this should be positive PED, no, positive YED, because if we're richer, we're likely to buy more of it. And then personal shopper is likely to be a positive YED as well, because um, the more you earn, then you'll be able to afford pers more personal shoppers. One day, maybe I would be able to afford one, or never. Um, and also for olive oil, this might be a, have an active YD in some countries or in some cases, but in general, I believe we would still cook more um, if we are richer. So we might cook better food or have better olive oil as well. So it also depends on the type of olive oil, right? So are you talking about Tesco's olive oil? Then it might be negative because we might buy less Tesco's olive oil when our incomes go up. But if it is like some um, niche Italian extra virgin olive oil then it would be like uh, have a positive ID because we'll be buying more when our incomes rise and whereas if we look at the at number whether it's elastic or inelastic I would say this would be elastic and same with personal shoppers whereas for olive oil it's inelastic so just looking at which one is the necessity pretty much. That's kind of like the main criteria here. So yeah. And of course, here we can see some real life data of what income elasticity of demand is for these different products. 
So we can see we would actually import more from pharmaceuticals when our incomes go up. But we would buy less motor vehicles. And it's interesting to see how we would import more goods from developed countries as well, because they're like, likely to be more expensive and more pricey. So we see that we would buy quite a bit more compared to goods from developing countries. So pre presumably the goods from developing countries are likely to be cheaper and less luxurious. So that's kind of like the assumption that I'm making here. Okay, so let's say if you are a company that is planning to export products into the UK or sell products in the UK, then you know that the economy is also going into a recession because of coronavirus and because of Brexit as well then what are you going to sell or which product would you sell given this information below you? So again, I'll give you around like 10 seconds to have a think about it. And then we can discuss it. Okay, I think that's around time. So, as we can see here, um, first, let's address what we want to sell. So, if the economy is going into a recession, most likely this would mean that the demand for these products are decreasing. Yeah. Demand decreasing. Um, no, actually I take that back. I meant to say the incomes in that economy are decreasing and therefore the demand is decreasing. Yeah. So in that case, if incomes are decreasing due to the recession, then for normal goods the demand would decrease. So we wouldn't want to sell normal goods, right? We would want to sell inferior goods because we know that for inferior goods, when the income decreases, the demand would increase. So in that case, we're gonna um, find a good with a negative YED, which shows that it is an inferior good. So in this case, it would be machinery and equipment. So or at least people wouldn't buy less of it, right? If it is at say zero income elasticity of demand. Since, oh, where did my cursor go? Oh, there we go. So here we can see this would be kind of like the lowest YED. So this means that even though income decreases, um, the demand might slightly increase for this type of product. Or if you just treat it as zero, then the demand for this product won't necessarily change even if the income decreases. So therefore, we want to sell manufacturing, manufacturing, machinery and equipment instead of these other products. Yeah. Because we know for these other products, there are normal goods and then the demand for these products would decrease following a recession and a drop in incomes. And now if we look at the price elasticity of demand here, then um, it, it would help us determine whether we want to charge high or charge low than the current market price. So we know or we can see that the price elasticity of demand for machinery and equipment is actually quite um, inelastic, right? So if you recall, smaller than one 
is inelastic. So in this case, we want to charge higher prices if the good is inelastic because inelastic means people would still buy the good anyway, no matter how you change the price. So yeah, so you can see in this particular case or thought experiment, if the UK economy is in a recession following Brexit, then you would want to sell machinery and equipment into the UK um, with relatively high prices to make the most out of your sales and to increase our revenues. So finally, this is just like a chart showing, oh, no, oh, what did I do? Oh, unwhite screen, there we go. So finally, we, we've got like a chart just showing how the elasticities of transportation has changed over time. Um, you can see that like in like the 1850s, air transport or like flying by airplane used to be like a more luxurious or luxury product, right? So uh, most likely you need to have an, a relatively high increase in income in order to afford like airplanes. So the income elasticity um, would be positive for air travel and most likely to it would be quite high as well but now you can see that um, for transport the income elasticity has gradually decreased yeah. and that's because um, traveling by air has gotten cheaper and also traveling by motor vehicles has gotten cheaper as well because like in the 1850s you might not have a car or a car would be very expensive right so we see that the income elasticities are actually um, falling and you don't need a very high increase in income in order to like buy, an, buy a, to ride on the bus or to um, ride an Uber. Yeah. Similarly, the price elasticities has become, is becoming less uh, elastic as well. So it's becoming more inelastic. And simply because traveling by motor vehicles or by plane has become more of a necessity over time. Um, whereas like in the 1870s, you can just stay at your farm and you can just um, grow carrots and make a living. But now we need to go to cities and work and worship our corporate overlords. Yeah. So that's just some interesting data that you might want to look into but yeah so that's pretty much it for um, income elasticity and also price elasticity for demand and next up we're just going to do a quick um,